This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices. I'm Dennis Lawrence. Today we're going to go back to our Lawless Whistleblower event from July 27th and listen to Lori Scribner, a grandmother, telling her story. I want to remind everybody that we now are on Facebook. Come and join us. Uh, there's some interesting conversations going on. Uh, information that you may very much uh, treasure and take to heart. Uh, in fight, uh, we're growing in numbers fighting this entity called CPS in the family court system. Before we go to Lori's tale, we're going to go to a daily meditations from our friends at Legally Kidnapped. Let's go to that clip now. grandparents to hold him in their loving arms. Social workers deciding where these children are going instead of letting the Ken take care of these children, family. We have had several reports around the state of Michigan and nationwide really of family not getting their Ken. We have a report from Elegant County of grandparents getting their foster care licenses. Yep, they had three grandchildren and the foster care agency only granted them a license to take care of two of them. The foster care agency, Bethany Christian Services, wanted, wanted to keep the baby. These grandparents story, they touched me so much because I was a grandparent that lost my grandchildren my granddaughters, Sabrina and Fantasia, to the system. A system that only told half-truths. A system that made excuses for not giving family the opportunity and the chance to take their girls. The Miller family over on the east side of the state they won their Section 45 hearing against Bill Johnson in the state of Michigan. It was thrown in the appeals court where they lost again. They were licensed, and a month later, after they had lost the chance to adopt their grandchildren, they were offered three foster children that were not related. The Verdes out there in California 
Bethany Christian Services sanctioned 16 times, 16 times for not following the rules of kinship providing. All the agency receives is a slap on the patty wax. Ladies and gentlemen, this got to stop. Families being separated right here in the state of Michigan by our government. It needs to cease and decease. Lori Scribner, our host, our guest today, will tell her story. She was featured on WXYZ. TV in an interview. A heartwarming story and this woman has spent time after time doing what she was told. She was told to get a bigger house. She went out and got a bigger house. She was told she didn't make enough money. So she went out and went right back to work making good money. She's also licensed yet denied adoption of her grandchildren. Let's go to that clip from our whistleblower event from July 27th, Lori Scribner. Uh, let's go to um, a couple more injured parents. Lori Scribner has a good story to tell. Goes from one state to another. And uh, uh, good to see another speaker just arrive. So, Lori, if you'll come to the microphone, tell your story, then we'll, we'll record that and get it to our congressmen and legislators. Hello, my name is Lori Scribner. Um, I live in Florida. Uh, my grandchildren were taken in Muskegon County, Michigan, and placed in foster care. Um, several months after they re were removed, I was contacted. They questioned me about whether or not I was willing to take the children. They questioned me about where I worked, um, where I lived, that sort of thing. Um, I said that I was willing to take the children. They asked me where I was living at the time. I said I was uh, living in a two-bedroom place. They asked me where I worked, and I told them the hospital I worked at. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the emergency room. They asked me if I was working um, full-time or part-time. I said I was working part-time. Um, they said, well, there's four children. You wouldn't be eligible with a two-bedroom to take all four. There's one boy, three girls. They said, would you be willing to take just the girls? I said, yeah, if you know, you can send them down. I'll I'll take the girls, and if I move into a place later that's bigger, you'll let me get the boy. And they said yeah, but and then they said um, they wanted to know. Um, I they said you're working um, part time. They said you'll need to work full time before you can get the kids. Also, so. Um, at any rate, um, I said, okay, um, I'll, I'll work on that. And then I said, um, but I think I make enough, but she didn't ask me how much I made to take the kids anyway. Um, then they said I couldn't have the children anyway right now because they were working on reunification. As long as they were working on reunification, they told me that I was not eligible to get the kids because the mother lived in Michigan and I lived in Florida and that would be a long distance. Um, so the children stayed in foster care. Um, I wrote the judge at one point. I said that I talked to the mother. She was willing to move to Florida and so that she could continue with reunification even if the kids moved in with me. I was now working full time. Um, I moved out of my two bedroom and I bought actually um, a house that has five bedrooms and three full baths. So there was plenty of room and we could all be there. If the mother was there, there was actually a, um, one bedroom and another room and a bathroom that was separate on the house. So she could live there and I could live in the main house with the children 
if the situation re reversed where they return the children with her, she could live in the whole house and I'd go live in the back. You know, so either way, it would have fit. Um, that made, made no difference. They just continued on working on, um, they said they were working on reunification. They continued on with that. Um, the judge told the caseworker to get a home study. I had no idea what that was at that time. The caseworker said, that's a conflict of interest. Her son's rights have already been terminated. They terminated my son's rights immediately at, after they took the children into care. He was in jail and they said he had no hope of reuniting with them. So they terminated his rights, even though he did have, he could have reunited with them. And, but he never did get that chance. He never had any chance to do that. Um, they continued on working supposedly on reunification, even though after the hearing, the caseworker um, walked out very angry because they weren't, because the judge said to continue reunification and she wanted to go for termination. Um, she said, this isn't over yet. As she walked out of the courtroom, um, she continued to make accusations um, against the mother every time the mother tried to reunite, she'd have a visit. Um, the mother had a roommate. Her roommate, um, Marcy, had a pet snake in the house. Um, it was about so big. They said the snake wrapped itself around Estiana's neck and tried to suffocate her. And it had to be pried off her neck. Um, I recently, you know, and I thought, you know, Marcy said it wasn't true, Kathy said it wasn't true. I thought, well, maybe one of the kids just said that. I didn't know. Recently, with my Section 45 hearing, um, my attorney was able to see that file. We haven't been able to get all of the files. Discovery was denied to us, but they did get a small portion of the files, and that was in there. The kids denied that that ever happened. They said it never happened in the report. Um, it was, there was a snake. They said they um, touched the snake, but the snake was kept in its cage and it was always there. They opened it up and let the kids touch the snake and um, that the oldest boy fed the snake something. And I think it was a dead mouse or something that they, they buy them at the, um, pet store, but other than that, that was that. Um, they made other accusations. They said that the ch that the children had been sexual sexually abused. That's a hot button issue. They love to say that. Um, what they said, as far as sexual abuse was, was that um, the children had witnessed their parents having sex. Not that anyone had ever been touched or anything like that, just that their parent, they had witnessed their parents having sex. Well, that was another report that my attorney was able to see. Um, and that was false also. The children didn't know anything about that. That was something um, the foster parents had brought up and said that it happened, that the kids were telling them that, but when they question, when CPS questioned the children about it, the children didn't know anything about it. They were, they were just, no, you know, just like normal kids would be. So each time they would try, when she was trying to get reunification and the judge had ordered it, the caseworker kept presenting these things as if they were fact. The prosecutor presented these things as if they were fact. The guardian ad litem presented these things as if they were fact. But the fact was, they weren't fact. They were all false. So at one point, she continued on. She felt um, she was never going to get the kids back. And they were going for termination now. I, was, I put in for guardianship. She was going to sign the children over to me. She said she was going to sign the paperwork. I hired an attorney. The attorney said, yes, that's something we can do. She still has her rights. She can sign them over to you. When they got to court, I wasn't there. 
um, there was going to be two court dates a little bit apart, so I was going to come to the next one because this one was very short and I have a long way to go. So I, they didn't think much was going to happen here that other than saying we're going to do this and then we would have to come back. So they went to court. She said that she was that she wanted me to have the kids. They told her that she, they then said that it was too late. She couldn't sign the kids over to me. That I could not get the kids. But that if she would agree to willingly sign off her rights, I could still go for the guardianship. And unless they found something egregious that had to do with me, that I would get the kids. That they would send them then down to Florida for two weeks, and upon returning, we'd have another court date. And as long as everything was fine, um, I would get the kids. By this time, I had already gone through and become a foster parent. I had my foster parents, parent license. I, as I said before, I'm a registered nurse. When I lived in Michigan, I actually took care of some medically fragile foster children. Um, as a nurse coming into a home where these children were, um, but still, when it came down to it, then they changed their mind. They said the kids could not go for a visit in Florida for two weeks. They said the children were traumatized by their grandmother and that that would cause them too much trauma to go to Florida. They said that the reason that they were traumatized by their grandmother was because I reported that the children had been sexually abused in their foster home. And that subjected the girls to a full sexual exam. Um, later on, months later, a CPS worker was there and testified in court. She said no sexual, no, there was never any report made by me or anyone else that the foster parents had sexually abused the children and the children never had a full sexual exam. They had been looked at for bruises before, but they have never had a sexual exam. So all of that was a lie in order to keep the children from visiting with their grandmother because they knew at that time that all of the children wanted to live with me. And they knew that if the children were able to get to visit me and they had a court date immediately afterwards that there was no way they could say that the kids had bonded with these people because they hadn't. So then they began to work on bonding. They began to tell the children things like, your grandmother never wanted you. She doesn't love you. Your grandmother is a liar. In fact, during one visit I had that was supervised by Holy Cross Children's Services, Brooke Bigler was there. I had a recording on a, in my going in a bag sitting on the table. I left the room for a short period of time um, to go to the bathroom. When I um, listened to the recording after I got home, um, Brooke Bigler was talking to the children. She said, now why aren't you supposed to be with your grandmother? Why aren't you supposed to be alone with your grandmother? Because she tells lies, they said. And Miss Brooke Bigler said, yes, you girls are so smart. All of you are so smart. You are so smart. And that's what is on my tape recording. Her telling the children that they are so smart because they learned to call their grandmother a liar. So um, time went on. My guardianship was denied by Judge Barry Eddy. I have filed an appeal that has not been heard yet but the appeal has been granted. What will happen in that case, I don't know. The judge did not hold up adoption. Um, he did not put in a stay for adoption. The, uh, they were able to still place the child, children in an adoptive home. However, they are not able to finalize that adoption. I put in for um, adoption as well. Of course, the agency picked the foster family. Um, 
during the course of um, this, many things came out about the foster family, things they had done. At one point, the foster father testified in court. He put hot sauce and fish oil in the kid's mouth. That's not allowed under licensing rules. Um, it's in a report that he slapped one of the, that the foster mother slapped one of the girls. Um, they also, the kids also came to me during a visit and started crying and screaming because one of them accidentally wet their pants and said that she just went ballistic after she wet her pants because she said, he's going to take me to the bathroom he's going, or to the utility room and he's going to slap me. And, he's gonna, and, he's, and he hits so much harder than she does. And she did not want me to bring her back at that point. Um, they've made the kids run laps until they cried because um, they were so sore. And these things were all, are all written in their reports. They have reports on all of these things. They're not, they know about it. Um, but they always minimize it to say that, you know, they, she hit her, she slapped her hand one time, or she put one drop of hot sauce on their mouth, or they were made to write, run two laps around the house. When Jordan will say, and right in the report it has qu Jordan quoting, saying, more like 50 <laughs> laps around the house, you know, and one of the little girls, Carmen, while she was at a visit with her mother, she, well, her mother woke up in the morning and heard Carmen crying. She went into the bedroom. She said, Carmen, you know, what's, what's wrong? Why are you crying? Carmen said, I have to go to the bathroom and nobody told me I could get up yet because in her foster home, she's not allowed to get out of her bed in the morning until somebody tells her it's okay. Somebody has to tell her it's okay for her to get out of bed to go potty. And when they went into this home, they had been in one other home first. The boy was in a separate home and the girls were in one home. The boy did not adjust well in the home he was in and I don't know a whole lot, I haven't been able to find out a whole lot about that foster home. The foster home the girls were in was a very nice home. Um, the first one. It was Miss Ruth. She was a very sweet and loving lady. She um, cared very much about the girls. She wanted to get the boy too, but instead they moved these kids two hours away to Tustin, Michigan, north near Cadillac, when they could have stayed right near where their mother could have worked on reunification when they said they can't go to Florida because it's too far. They still move the kids two hours away when the mother didn't even have a car to a different home and the first foster mother was very sweet and loving she said the kids were well behaved um, she had no issues with them when they went to the next foster home the girls suddenly started having problems wetting their pants during the day they never had this issue before and that concerns me and it concerns me that they were met with being taken to a utility room and getting hit when they had an accident. All of these things I brought up to the caseworker, they shrug their shoulders and they walk away. They, they, don't, even, they don't even care. It's nothing to them. They keep saying every, every time, the kids are doing so much better, they're doing so much better. The kids are plugging along. They're doing as well as they can. I've not been able to see them since last October um, when they stopped visits. But, you know, they're plugging along. They're doing as best they can. They're trying to adjust. But when I, see, when I did see them the last few times, they're just, they just look so forlorn. I mean, they just stare out. They don't say anything. They just they look sad. Their faces are sad, they're sad. This year I, I've learned through going to court that the oldest girl is doing um, much more poorly in school this year. I'm sure it's because they cut off her mother's visits and 
the rest of her family's visits. That was very important to her. Um, she's she's just she's doing poorly in school. They say now that they say now she's been diagnosed with ADD and dyslexia, and that's the reason why she's doing poorly in school. But I. I have to say that when you get diagnosed with something, it doesn't make you do poorly. You would have done poorly before that. When you get diagnosed with something, you get help and you should be doing better, not worse. So um, I'm still fighting. I'm still um, going for my appeal for the guardianship. I finished my Section 45 this week. I don't know what the result of that is yet. Um, if it doesn't go through, I will be appealing that as well. And that's all I, I have. I love, if, I, if the children ever see this, I want them to know that we all love them. Their whole entire family loves them. And we haven't ever given up. I haven't given up, your grandmother. Your mother hasn't given up. Your father hasn't given up. Your aunts, your uncles, and your cousins, none of them have given up. We all love you and we all miss you. And there's a big hole in our family without you. Thank you. As we've talked with uh, various uh, relatives, for instance, uh, we've seen some folks that uh, as we look at them and talk with them and hear about their credentials and we think what more could you ask for okay in Lori's case I don't know what more to ask for uh, there's another gal that's uh, from out of state that came back for a section 45 hearing and as we talked with her for a while at a meeting here and in the courthouse uh, what more could you ask for and um, it just seems uh, bewildering that uh, you know what's going on and uh, we think federal money has something to do with that. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, that. We have Citizens for Parental Rights meetings held every month, the third Monday of the month from 7 to 9 p.m. at the studios, uh, 5261 Clyde Park Avenue, Wyoming, Michigan. Come on out and join us to reform Thank this. Thank you for watching this week. Remember, we have an email ad address for comments, suggestions, and that is at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. We also have a social network which you can visit, and that's at miparentalrights.ning.com. That's miparentalrights.ning.com. Until next week, remember, your voice can make the difference.